And thanks for all of you for making the trek out today. As Justin Wilson would say, I'm sure glad for me to see y'all. <laughs> if we could get the lights down here in the front, that would really be helpful on our screen. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about botany, a little bit about history, a little bit about marketing and marketing strategy and how all of that relates to fragrance and roses and how fragrance and roses was guided by many things. So the, from the botanical part, the rose family is the third largest plant family. It's only exceeded by grasses and orchids, or the other two larger families. But there are some members of the rose family you might not recognize, some of you might. For instance, there's apples, and pears, <laughs> the plums and apricots and apriums and pluots and whatever combination you might want to make of those, uh, peaches and nectarines and cherries as well, but also strawberries and blackberries and marionberries and raspberries, but not farkleberries. Farkleberries are in a different class. You guys grow farkleberries, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Good chicken. And then a lot of ornamentals, too. So this is, uh, <clears throat> hello, Brain. Pyracantha and Potentia as well. And what typifies the rose family is this little part of the flower right here. This is called the hypanthium. So behind the flower itself, you will see the green cup of the rose. And within that cup are all of the ovaries for it to set and grow its seed. And every rose family member has a hypanthium. Some of them may be cup-shaped like this. Some of them may be extruded like this one. This is from strawberry itself. But when it swells up on the rose, then it becomes the rose tip. So the hypanthium then develops flesh and holds the seed and becomes the rose hip. All roses originated in the northern hemisphere. There were over 100 species. None of them came from the southern hemisphere. Now there's a very small group that came from America, oddly enough in the western states. There's a medium-sized group that came from Europe mostly in Middle Europe. And the great majority came from China, a huge majority. In fact, there's some theory that the two populations in Europe and in America were probably brought there by early Chinese travelers. But that's just in theory. And all of those roses, pretty much all of them, had five petals. And they bloomed once, whether it would be in the spring or the summer. But even with those restrictions, the Chinese have been gardening with roses for over 2,000 years. And it was probably the early rugosas that they were growing. But one day, in a small province, the Sichuan province, they saw what we think is just a naturally occurring mutation of a rose that was repeat flowering. And they began to grow it. That was 1,300 years ago. And they began to spread it throughout China because it's called the monthly rose. Here we call it old blush. And if you'd like to attempt the Chinese pronunciation of those names, you're welcome. <laughs> but that is the parent that gave us repeat bloom in all of the modern roses today. Now this changed rose history. When the first tea roses came over, uh, they made a big splash. But it was the Chinese that actually had hybridized, and they had not just selected natural seedlings that occurred, they actually went out and hand pollinated and collected the seed. And they were the first to do some interspecies crosses. The one species was Rosa, Rosa gigantea, and the other species was, of course, our little repeat little friend, which is a form of chinensis called spontanea. <coughs> so these produced the early tea roses. And as I pointed out to you, it was from hand pollination. Now, it probably was not from that petri dish or that brush. But you get the idea that this was something that they intended to do and to conduct was to get bigger flowers on that little repeat little plant. 
Now these were in existence for quite a while, but we didn't know about them until the tea trade began to use ships rather than going over land to bring tea back from China into Europe. Once they started using the ships, that allowed them to successfully carry plants over that would live. And hence the tea roses came to Europe. And they were named tea roses because they were in the tea ships. So some of these early teas had that long bud and larger flower with more petals. Uh, generally a nice fragrance. That's Lady Hillington. Now these weren't specifically ones that came over from China, but these were ones that were quickly developed after the tea roses landed. William R. Smith and Mrs. B. R. Kant. But you get the style that these flowers had. You get the flower form, which was very unique in roses in its day. So let's run this down. On China's role in rose history, most of the original rose species originated in China. Roses have been cultivated in Chinese rose gardens for over 2,000 years. The monthly rose originated in the Sichuan province over 1,300 years ago, and this was the first repeat bloomer. The Chinese were first to cross two rose species to prevent a large flower type of tea roses which came over in the tea, European tea trade in the ships. Tea roses set the standard for beauty of roses, and this is the important part, not only in garden roses, but in florist roses as well, because the florist industry was suddenly born because of these tea roses. At that time, they were just beginning to grow <coughs> ornamental plants for cut blooms in greenhouses in the Northeast. But it made no sense to do roses because they only bloomed once, and they took up a lot of space. I mean, we had a few repeat bloomers, like the Rose of Castile, but they weren't really dependable repeat bloomers the way the Chinese tea roses were. And that's when Europe went mad for roses, when these repeat blooming large flower varieties showed up on their shores. Empress Josephine especially managed to collect all of them what they considered the known roses of her day in her garden at Maui Salon and invited breeders and botanists and artists to come in and make usage of this beautiful chance. And that really advanced roses dramatically, not only in their breeding, but also in their popularity as well. What really came forth from that is the classic hybrid tea form, that long bud, that spiral, open bloom, beautiful long stems and hopefully great fragrance. And the first hybrid tea that was produced was La France in 1867. Mm. And it was a cross of those tea roses into some of the European bloodlines that, that began this story. Now Slater's Crimson China, also from China, is the rose that gave us the red color in roses today, even though it doesn't look extensively red in and of itself. It gave us the red pigment. So something like firefighters, which has that sort of dullish red color, really came from Slater's Crimson China, another China rose. Breeding continued on for bright colors with Rosa Fetida. When it was brought into the bloodlines, that's when intense, brilliant colors became possible. And that's where the first really deep yellows started occurring because the yellows of the tea roses were soft yellow colors at best. So one of those first crosses was Soleil d'Or. And that was from the Pernay du Cher nursery in France in 1900. These are some of the offspring from that breeding work with Rosa Fetida. These are the brilliant colors that we've come to know today so just to pop a few names in, none of these could have been possible in their color with just the tea rose bud line. A little bit more history. The first floor of Bundy came about from the Danish rose nursery, Polson nursery, when they crossed a polyantha with a hybrid tea. But they didn't call them floor abundance. That name wasn't coined until it came to America, 
And America marketed the first floor abundant in 1940 under that class, and it was World's Fair from Portis that was the first one to be called a floor abundant. Eventually, the rest of the world kind of joined in. There were some other great people who made a big difference in roses. You might know this guy. Yeah, great to see his face again. And not only did he give us miniature roses and stripes with modern mosses, and have the breadth of his experimentation was phenomenal. Because it was really phenomenal because he didn't have the commercial pressure to produce the profit maker in a short period of time. He can make big crosses that took 30 and 40 years to see an offspring. And we all benefited magnificently from it. So Stars and Stripes came out in 1976, and that was really the first <coughs> striker. And now you see them all over the place. And Ralph intentionally introduced, he had two stripe varieties, Stars and Stripes and Pinstripe. He didn't put Pinstripe out first because it was fertile, and Stars and Stripes was sterile because he knew other breeders would grab the work right away. Except you find out when you took Stars and Stripes south of the hemisphere into McGrady's land in New Zealand, it became fertile. Oh my gosh. So it didn't quite work on him when it was planned. And of course, David Austin was the one that really restored the love of old rose form. Again, it broke the hybrid T form mold. And that was Constance Fry back in 1961. As I understand it, he went through about two bankruptcies before this concept actually caught. So he was a dreamer that had a long road ahead of him. And there's still lots of novelties to be had. Like that ladybug with her spots up in the top. Hmm. This is one of the Helthenia hybrids with the dark eye. This is the old 1856 Baron. Yeah, that one, you know that one. And then uh, the spine for freckled roses, and that was predominantly for work from Dr. Buck at Iowa State. And this is the one, the one rose that all of our docents show our visitors. I mean, we have hundreds, thousands of beautiful roses, and why do they show off the bloody green rose? <laughs> a weirdo from China in the 1850s. But well, all of the garden roses today have benefited from those Chinese bloodlines and from those other breeders' work to bring forth all types of roses, climbers, shrubs, ground covers, uh, miniatures, deep purple colors and stripes. But what we often don't talk about is what did it do to the forest rose industry? They make more, a lot more money in forest roses than they do in garden roses. So it was a major driving interest to get roses that you could put in a greenhouse that would give lovely long stems in that beautiful form. Ophelia and Radiance and Madame Butterfly are examples of some of that early hybrid tea work where they were looking for those long buds that they could then cut and sell in the florist trade. <clears throat> now this is kind of an exaggeration uh, but we've gone that far in florist roses. <clears throat> so just to make a little difference, the florist the greenhouse roses, are, they want long stem flowers with long buds. They're produced under artificial environments. Whereas garden roses are grown outdoors for natural conditions, for garden decoration, and for cut blooms. The variants in what the desires are have almost created two different races of roses, the florist rose versus the garden rose. Now almost all of the greenhouse production of roses now has moved off of our shores. It was a vital industry in America up until the mid-1980s. And now it's in South America and Africa and Israel. And these flowers are flown in from great distances and produced under artificial conditions. So just to break it down again, a greenhouse rose are interested in stem length, bud length, base life, and productivity in short days. Garden roses, we're looking at bushy habit, shapely flowers from the bud to the open flower. They don't care what the open flower looks like. 
fragrance and good health and a good finish and fast to repeat bloom. So these are some of the things that have separated these two lines completely. <laughs> so how does that deal with fragrance? Well, let me lead you down that road just for the smell of it. I think people imprint early on fragrant flowers as a child. <clears throat> if you ask people what their favorite flower would be, I'd say 9.8% of, 9 of the top 10 would say something that's fragrant. Whether it's an iris, a hyacinth, a gardenia, whatever they imprinted on. And fortunately, one of those great imprints are the roses. And people expect roses to be fragrant. We're really fortunate that we don't live in an area where we imprint on some of these flowers. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Replesia up here, one of the world's largest flowers. And these are Stapelia down here in the bottom. And of course, you see the Amorphophallus. All of these smell of rotten meat because they're pollinated by flies. So there is a purpose. But let's get back to rose fragrance. As I've worked through the years breeding roses and studying different examples, I can tell you that fragrance is a lot of time linked to other characteristics genetically. And they're not good characteristics. <laughs> One of them is weak peduncles. Now, peduncle is the neck of the flower, from the stem to the flower itself. Mm -hmm. And correctly, it should be peduncle, but of course, I'm from Texas, so it's a peduncle. <laughs> Because we hop in our peacock and the people we drive in the library. But an uncle or pre uncle, either way will work. And that's what happens if you get flowers who bow. Fragrant flowers are often have poor color retention. So their colors wash, wash out or alter or blue badly from the fresh flower. And many times it's not complimentary. So here's a bad fade from the original. Most fragrant roses have soft substance, so the soft substance is the thickness of the petal. So the thicker the petal, the longer the vase line, the lesser the fragrance. And lastly, many of our favorite, favorite fragrant flowers are disease susceptible. So all of these things really influenced fragrance in roses in an out of the way pattern. So for instance, in the florist trade, you had to pack these and ship them over long distances. If they had weak necks, those flowers would break in a box. So early on in the breeding of the hybrid teas, they were looking for erect necks on the flowers so they, they could be shipped and not broken. And what happens when you select for a weak or for a strong peduncle? You inadvertently ship fragrance out the window along the way. So that was the florist breeders that was probably doing that work. It was the garden breeders in the 1960s who were looking for intense, pure colors. Pure orange, bright red, deep yellow. And we've already talked about how color is often murky on fragrant flowers. So again, by them looking for depth of color and stability of color, fragrance got kind of shoved out the door a little bit more. And I think that period of time is when people came up with this whole idea of all the new roses have lost their fragrance. Because in that period of time, it was pretty true. Now, vase life, there's another issue. Now that we're shipping our cut roses from South America all throughout the world, they have to stand up in the vase. So they need thick petal substance. When you're selecting for thick petal substance, you end up with no fragrance because the fragrant varieties are thin petal and they don't last very long. Mm -hmm. And you can look at all this different breeding now for the florist varieties, different colors, and they will last 14 to 20 days mm -hmm. in the vase. And they have all the romance of an artichoke. <laughs> they even sound like an artichoke if you squeeze them. <laughs> and that's because there's chlorophyll in the petal, and that chlorophyll gives you extra vase life. Witness St. Patrick. The reason it lasts so long is because there's green in the petals, 
and it's actually making food for the plant. Huh. Huh. And then, of course, the great search for disease resistance means that you end up with varieties that are clean, but they have no fragrance. But I'm happy to report that really all of these genetic links have been broken with persistent breeding work. And you have varieties like Francis Mayon, you know, which has wonderful fragrance and great disease resistance. I, I can hear what... The variety is Francis Mayon, and it has great disease resistance and fragrance, so it's one of the breakthrough varieties. So I hear this all the time in the garden. Only the old roses have fragrance. None of the new varieties have any smell, and I feel somewhat between this <laughs> and this. <laughs> when we explain, uh, what have you been smelling lately? And mostly it's florist roses they've been smelling, which don't have any fragrance. So, <clears throat> the other common thing I see in the garden when people are testing for fragrance is that they're smelling a rose that's just about to fall off the plant. They're not smelling anything fresh. And they're smelling it at the wrong time. So let's help them learn when to smell and what to smell. So you want to smell a flower that's just freshly open or partially open because that fragrance is an oil at the base of the petals. So as the flower opens, that oil begins to dissipate into the air. The longer that flower has been open, the less fragrance it's going to have. So you want to smell a fresh flower. You want to smell it when the humidity is stronger, it's deeper. So early morning or right at twilight, you'll get a stronger fragrance than you will in the heat of the day. And you want to clear out your sniffer and the flower. That's always a good thing to do. Every nose smells its own rose. Another common question, which is the most fragrant variety in your collection? And the answer is it's up to the smeller. Really, because we each detect fragrance differently than others. I think men smell very differently from women. Men will pick up the fresh cut apple fragrance, whereas women will pick up the fruity fragrance stronger and easier. The location of the rose is a factor in Southern California, the variety Color Magic, to me, has absolutely no fragrance. I go to my parents' home in Dallas, and it's the most fragrant variety in the garden. Same rows, different conditions. And also the time of day, and even the time of year. Uh, years ago, friends brought me a very late season bouquet of Touch of Class. This was like at Thanksgiving. And it was so powerfully fragrant. And normally it has absolutely no fragrance at all. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the state of your brain. Mm -hmm. If you're in a foul mood, you shouldn't be out there smelling your roses. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to get any better. <laughs> now, let's look at some types of fragrance. And again, this is my interpretation of those types of fragrance. It kind of gets into the wine tasting. Uh, descriptions, you know, where you read on the bottle, they said it had notes of leather and raspberry. I'm thinking, what? Well, there's leather in this? So this is my interpretation. The damask smell, of course, is the old rose fragrance, the classic hybrid tea rose fragrance. And to me, both Grand Dame and Memorial Day uh, possess that type of fragrance. Hmm. Licorice is relatively common, especially in the yellow bloodlines. You'll see it more there than any other color. So Julia Child has a tone of licorice in her fragrance, and of course white licorice has an intense tone of licorice in its fragrance. Fresh cut apple. To me, Playboy really smells strongly of fresh cut apple. And Soaring Spirits, one of its distant offsprings, also has that fragrance as well. And you can get any combination of these fragrances in roses as well. The fruity fragrance, now that one kind of passes me by. I don't get it as strong, but Julie Newmar is intensely fruity in its fragrance, and so is Over the Moon. Citrus Blossom. So it's a bit of lemon, a bit of lemon blossom as well. 
Uh, to me, out of the blue, smells a lot like lemon pledge. <laughs> and all the regular people over to smell it. Of course, when you tell them, smell that when it smells like lemon pledge, it implants that idea in their brain. <laughs> and this is a good one. I will until 2021. So you'll have to watch for this one. It truly has no name, but it has a wonderful fragrance. The honey fragrance is a little more difficult to capture. I really didn't think gourmet popcorn had a fragrance until we were doing a photograph shoot and we left the plant, the blooming plant in the studio overnight and you open the door the next morning and their strong honey fragrance came through. Uh -huh. And people tell me of Iceberg having a honey fragrance as well. JMP sold Iceberg in their fragrant collection for many years. Mm -hmm. Kind of bewildered me, but they did. And then one of my favorites, the spice fragrance. And fragrant cloud is a typical of this, but also a rock and roll. And its offspring, uh, Neil Diamond, now, is somewhere between spice and rose. And here's one more no-name for you. This one's a little closer. This is 2018. And a lot of the health thing you're reading, this is the darker center that you see in the flower. A lot of those hybrids have a really strong, spicy fragrance to them. It's very nice. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is a cross between Sweet Chariot and Eyes for You. Now, the purple fragrance, or the purple colors, possess a lot of the clove fragrance. And this actually traces back to the Rosa Californica and their bloodline, which is about six or seven generations back. And it's another favorite fragrance of mine. So there's a good time, of course, and now Twilight Zone is a little more fruity fragrance to it, but Eptide is intensely uh, clove in its fragrance, and Eptide's sister is Midnight Blue, also a clovey fragrance, and then another sister that's hard to find is called Route 66, and they all three possess that strong clovey fragrance. Yep, Pond's Cold Cream. <laughs> And Sugar Moon does it best. Yeah, that's another one that I point to people and say, that smells like Pond's Cold Cream. <laughs> and those who remember are like, oh my God, I, know. I remember Grandma wearing that stuff all the time. And then there's some that are debatably pleasant or not. To me, the myrrh fragrance isn't a real pleasant fragrance, but I know a lot of people like it. And many of the Austin roses possess the myrrh fragrance. So, uh, Lady Emma Hamilton, fantastic variety. And Amory's Rose, which is lovely but a little weak. Uh, but those two still have that nice myrrh fragrance to them. And then there are some that are downright unpleasant. You know, there is a rose called Rose of Fetida because of its fetid odor. Uh, we modify that description a little bit and call it the cat box. <laughs> And Cinco de Mayo has a touch of cat box to it. <laughs> yeah, not bad. It is there. So fragrance is a fun one to nail down because you're not going to nail it down. It has so many variables and so many personal things to it that it is always going to be different. So now I have to plug the, the company. <laughs> I hope you will come visit us again at the Huntington Library soon. If you haven't been in a while, not only have there been changes in the Rose Garden, there have been tremendous changes in the garden overall. We have a brand new six acre California ranch garden at the entrance. We have an expanding Chinese garden that's still under construction. As of next year, it will be the largest Chinese garden outside of China. And it's set for completion in the fall of 2018. Just last year, we received a collection of cycads from a private collector. Cycads are primitive uh, forms of pine trees, although they look like palm trees. And if you grow a sago palm, you grow a cycad. And these are extremely rare. And we will have the largest cycad collection in the United States as a result of this transplant. So some exciting stuff coming up. And to keep up with me, uh, if you're in the Twitter sphere, come on. Oh, there he is, on the game. You can find me at Tom Carruth Roses.
Oh, and I will send out about three posts a week, usually with a picture of a rose or something happening in the rose garden or a beautiful bloom nearby, in a brief description. So please follow me if you get a chance. Let's turn on the lights and we'll do a few questions. I didn't intend for the topic to be quite so drag. No, it's wonderful. Sorry about that. Usually oh, I have more corny jokes I can plug in. But, <laughs> but you guys were my guinea pigs on this first call. Oh. Have a question in the back? Yes. What is your definition of a ranch garden that they're going to have? The California Ranch Garden is really more what the garden would have looked like when Mr. Huntington bought the property in 1903. So it will have things that are drought tolerant, that are more Mediterranean in their style. So olives, unusual, oh, we'll bring you some Australian, some Gervilias, some Hesperalos, and it's a very unique garden. You'll have to see it. Beautifully done. Beautifully done. <coughs> yes, sir? Some of uh, the old roses <coughs> that have been fragrant, old hybrid teas, <coughs> to me, and this is just me, it's not empirical, seem to lack the fragrance that I remember them have. Now, it could be my sniffer, but are there problems with newer manifestation of the old hybrid teas, newer bushes of the old hybrid teas? You know, there's always a, carrying their fragrance. There's forward. always the theory that some minor mutations that you don't really notice can happen and then you get propagated. <coughs> Uh, so that is possible, but I think in many ways our memory of what was fragrant is romanticized a little bit compared to the reality of it. So I think sometimes our memory is more romanticized as to what it really smelled like versus what it does smell like. I said it's not empirical. It just seemed like yeah. some of them just don't smell like what I remember. And that can happen, but our, our sniffers do wear out the time. One of my two gardeners that I have can't smell squat <laughs> at all. Not at all. Got a question over here? Yes. When is the best time to come see that garden? Well, we have color, you know, throughout most of the year. It kind of depends on what you want to see. If you want to see the roses in the spring flush, it would be like early April, early to mid-April. If you come in January, you'll see a spectacular display of the aloes in bloom in the desert garden, and the hummingbirds are in full fervor at that point you know a little, a little later in the spring the camellias are outstanding i mean there's always something happening but for the roses we have a big flush and it was a phenomenal flush this year in the spring i don't know if you guys saw that up here too but just amazing growth with this spring yeah. and that was in late march early april spring, lots of water. yeah lots of water i wish <laughs> not for us yes what approach do you use to get some of those nasty uh, things away from the fragrance, like, for example, disease uh, susceptibility. How did, how did you go about doing that as a hybridizer? You know, I think it was more just through observation of your seedlings and hoping for that variation. Uh, Sam McGrady taught me early on to breathe from as broad a bloodline as you possibly can and bringing it together. And other species work has been brought in thanks to like Ralph Moore and also Ping Lim has done extensive work on bringing species in that could give us some genetic variability that helps us through breaking this. But I think really more than anything, it was just getting a good population and making the right observation that you had something that was different and then hopefully breed with it. But how did you make your choice of, of process? <coughs> what process? Every, every, every cross you made had a goal. It wasn't just willy-nilly. Uh, Herb Swim taught me this. He, in fact, he would make me write down specifically my goals for each cross as to what I wanted to achieve. And then you select the two parents that you hope the characteristics combine together. That's the fun of rose breeding. In my mind, is it's not predictable. It's not A and B. We'll see at all, at all. And that was that was the challenge. That's where the art part came in of it. You could have all the genetics and all the knowledge that you wanted, but it was really the ability to see what you had and to put it into the right marketing stream. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rose. How many stock roses did you start out with? On, on, uh, in, 
And it, usually we would have about 120 different parents in any one year. Which ones did you start out with? Specifically? Um, I had some of my Armstrong reading work that I was working with. Uh, uh, Herb Swim had done some spectacular work with Rosa Soliana, the species, and carried it on about four generations. And that became a very important breeding lot for me. In fact, both uh, Julia Tal and Eptide have that ancestor in common with it. Uh, but, you know, I had some successes and some not. I really thought in the long run we could breed a rose that had maroon foliage year-round because in other rose family members, like peaches and plums, they have maroon foliage year-round. Didn't happen. Yeah, didn't happen. And I would change parents out frequently each season, bringing in new stuff, bringing in the, like I was breeding with Julia Tile uh, five years before its introduction. You know, I saw the good qualities of it immediately and brought it right into the breeding house, the work. Mm -hmm. Yes? Aside from the Oscars, are you certain you're trying to do the breeding focus on the fragrance? Keith Zary did a lot of focusing on fragrance. Uh, uh, a good portion of my varieties are fragrant as well. Um, I know Harm Seville in his latter years worked heavily with fragrance too. So it's coming from many sources. What was the name Keith? Keith Zary. He was the breeder for Jackson and Perkins. Mm -hmm. So a lot, a lot of his last hybrids were very fragrant. So like April in Paris and Crescendo along that line. <clears throat> now some of them suffered from soft petals as well. If you grow New Zealand, You've seen what it can do when the weather suddenly changes, it just balls up on you. And uh, that happens for us too. And then the next bloom cycle, after you've threatened it with a shovel, it's gorgeous. You know, it's not the time you're ready to dig it out, it'll be beautiful. Mm -hmm. One of Murphy's laws of gardening. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, Tom? At the Huntington, uh, the water system was so, when you got there, the water system was so ancient, and then uh, the Huntington got that endowment for the Rose Garden. How much has the infrastructure been changed on that, on the watering situation, and what's the state of it now? Uh, it's in a much better state than it was. And we're just installing a new system that will help us regulate the level that we retain. There are three wells on the property. Two of them, we found out just recently, were hand dug. Were dug by hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, one of them goes down about 90 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're in an unusual geological pattern where we're at, where the, the shift in the, in the substratum is actually keeping water right. underneath our garden more than the other areas around us. Mm -hmm. But we still have to play by the rules. We've laid eight miles of inline drip system now. <laughs> in the Japanese garden, in the new ranch garden, in the new stroll garden. Uh, I will, I will have a couple of rose plantings with Netafem, it's called, which is the inline drip system that was perfected in Israel. And uh, we'll be putting some in the rose garden now as well. So uh, it's been an extensive change. <coughs> yes, sir. Along those lines, uh, how do you adjust the net of them? It seems like you, there, there are so many emitters so far apart that it doesn't allow for um, odd plantings <coughs> or non inline plantings. I'm probably not the person to ask on that. Uh, we have a couple of people that have done nothing but lay net of them for a couple of years now. They would be your better source, so I, I don't know, really. I'm sure I will learn at some point. Yeah. But it is a, a, a product that has great promise. Now, uh, Leroy Brady in Phoenix, he has been putting in rose gardens with net of them for a long time and reports very good success. Rainbird has a similar product right now, I don't remember the name, but he actually kind of prefers the Rainbird product. Hmm. Yes, sir? On the uh, garden side of uh, raising uh, roses, what do you see as the economic feature? 
for as far as the rose industry, right. it's in a dire shape, very dire shape. Um, <clears throat> people in general are not gardening. The roses have fallen particularly out of favor because they're considered high maintenance. And then when they were convinced to buy a variety that was high, uh, was low maintenance, that variety suddenly showed up with rose rosette disease. And that's very discouraging to the average buyer. Uh, we've had our second year now of a new infestation of an insect called chili thrips. Hmm. And uh, that is very devastating. It was through every rose garden in Los Angeles. Hmm. Every rose garden in Los Angeles. So things like this are really detrimental to the business. Uh, commonly, when I was first in the business, we would, as an industry, sell 55 million plants a year. I doubt that we get 20 million now. Mm -hmm. And when it's, your market has decreased that much, it doesn't provide the incentive to mount an expensive hybridizing program. Mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, kind of a, a tough time. Mm -hmm. Tough time for roses. We're seeing nurseries disappear. Uh, I heard this figure and I don't doubt it. In Los Angeles alone, alone there are 48% less nurseries than there were in 2008. Uh, so we're getting down to the lows and the Home Depots, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. well, we saw some great nurseries go out just this year. And, and follow up on that chili trip, how did you go to California? What do you see? Is, is there any defense against it? Well, you're going, you're going to have to spray. I had to give up on my no-spray garden to conquer it. Uh, but they did respond to conserve, which is a bit of sad. Uh, but I'm also allowing out beneficials. I'm still on the beneficial trail. And conserve does not kill my beneficials. So we were putting out gobs of the mining pirate bug in the garden this year, which is a voracious little beetle that eats all kinds of insects. So I figure when we walk out in the garden and we hear pirate songs, we'll have a <laughs> <laughs> talk like a pirate. Yeah. Horror, horror, horror. So uh, it's it's a tough problem, and you don't see it until they are well advanced. Oh, yes. Well advanced, and you rarely see the insect itself. It is so small, you really have to make an effort to see the insect. Yes. Chili thrips. You know, we have Western flower thrift. That's the thrips that we've been, and by the way, thrips is one of those weird words that has an S on it, whether it's singular or plural. So Western flower thrips are what we've been fighting all these years, and they just deform the flowers. The chili thrips infest the whole growing point and deform the leaves, the flowers, the sepals, everything you can get its hands on. And they're so small, that they can travel in air currents up to 60 feet. And they're not just on roses. They're on about 300 different plants. Citrus, strawberries, chilies, which they're named for, uh, eggplant, cucumbers, basil. Uh, all of these are things that they will attack. What are you killing it with? Uh, spinosad is the active ingredient, and that comes under different brand names. So I know one brand name is Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. <laughs> and it works. Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, and you can get that at local hardware stores. <laughs> and but, garden centers. Uh, but that's a spin of sad. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Even with the conserve, you have to change your strategy. You have to change, that's right. After two or three applications to yep. something else. Because they, be because they can, they can, uh, reproduce every 12 days, yeah. then they can mutate readily to using the same chemical on them. And, and it's harder to get insecticidal soap now as a uh, concentrate, mm -hmm. which would have been a good go-to. Now, the good news for you guys is they love heat. Yeah. And they will not take a winter at all. So it's a very mild climate insect that loves hot conditions. It first came into Florida in 2004. And it's made its way now across the Gulf states into Texas and now finally into California. Uh, so it's taken a little while to get here. And they originated from Southeast Asia. So welcome to international trade, guys. Yeah. 
We have a little critter we're fighting at the Huntington called a Polyphagus shot hole boar, also from Southeast Asia, and it's a tiny little boring insect that has a symbiotic relationship with Fusarium root rot. And it bores into the tree, it infects it with root rot, it lays its eggs, the larvae feed on the infected wood, they escape, the tree is injured, and it's infected with Fusarium root rot. So all of our big English oaks in the lawn, gone. It'll take a tree down in two years on it. And, but they have found that there's a bacteria that will stop them. But now we're having to figure out how can we get that bacteria into the system of the tree itself. So another joy of international trade. This is why we have quarantine laws. As pesky as they can be for those of us who love plants and want to exchange plant material, uh, these quarantine laws serve a purpose and uh, uh, we really need to be vigilant about sharing material with with areas that we know might have an infection. Because you could give somebody a stem and it might have chili thrip on it and you not even know it. You know, so it, it is a dangerous passage of material. Yes, ma'am. Do these uh, tree boring insects, do they also affect the sequoia and the virus redwood? Not to my knowledge, no. No, they do not. <coughs> they do not. However, our redwoods in Southern California, because of the drought, are sad. So sad. They are so unhappy. You can just see it in them. And they just, they're just struggling to survive right now. <clears throat> well, that was on a happy gardening note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's oh, the good news? Yeah, I'm working on that. <laughs> The we'll good see. news is we still have hundreds of people flooding into the Huntington to see the gardens. And that's, that's the encouraging thing. That's what really encouraged me when I left the industry. I was, I was discouraged by where things were going. And I get into the, the garden at the Huntington and I see families loving the color and the fragrance and just enjoying their time. I feel like there's still hope, you know, along the way. We, we actually broke. 700,000 visitors last year oh, wow. at the Huntington. So uh, it's, it's an amazing place, it really is. I feel very fortunate to be working there. Yes, sir. One last question. Uh, I heard that the old rose crimson glory, because of its wheat mm -hmm. and so forth, makes a wonderful light and it's extremely fragrant. Is there anything new that would well, the climbing sports of bush roses, I generally do not recommend to people because when they sport to a climbing form, they lose the ability to flower under most situations. Uh, climbing iceberg is a rare exception to that, uh, but there's some genetic twig that happens when they mutate to a climbing form, they lose the ability to flower. Mm. So I think Crimson Glory in the climbing form would be a, a bigger headache than Crimson Glory in the bush form on it. As far as red fragrant climbers, not on the horizon that I see right now. There are many good climbers coming, but not really in the red. I, I know of a red climber coming, but it's not highly fragrant as well. So if we can get the Olympiad color with the Mr. Lincoln fragrance, oh. and knock out disease resistance, oh. yeah. We'll be in heaven. You know, we want something different at that point. <laughs> <laughs> That's why our salesmen did me all the time. We get this and they go, well, we don't want that now. Yeah. Great. Yes, sir. What was the most popular rose you ever had tonight? Uh, I think sales-wise, uh, Julia Child, Probably fall up there. Yeah. Yeah, it's good, but it's not as high a seller as, as Julia. Because Julia was introduced worldwide, which is very rare. That a rose looks the same everywhere it goes. So it has about eight different names now throughout the world. But it looks exactly like it does here in every place that it goes to, which is very unusual. Very unusual. Yes. Any 
time you see a person's name, you have to have their approval on it. And Julia actually chose the variety before she passed away. She never saw it come to commerce, but she chose it. And we had been after her for several years to name a variety, and she always said, oh, I'm not worthy, and wouldn't do that. And I had sent this unnamed seedling to a family friend of hers in Santa Barbara. She happened to see it in the garden flowering and made the comment, if I were ever to have a rose, that would be nice. And we start. She wanted a she wanted a stable color. It didn't have to be yellow. She didn't like blend colors. Yeah. You're out. Yeah. And believe me, we worked every food phrase into that description we could. Yeah. So uh, I think she would, would have been proud of what she chose. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. There used to be a wonderful nursery in Southern California, Paul J. Howard's. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know knew of that many years ago. Mm -hmm. Is there any nursery like that now? No. No. There's not. Unfortunately, there's not. You had a question? Oh, it's about the name. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we've ended up with quite a few. People love the celebrity roses. Mm -hmm. It's funny. So this year we planted Marilyn Monroe next to John F. Kennedy. And <laughs> 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 it's kind of fun. Hey guys, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> Tom, you, you said which is your favorite, which one was commercially the most successful, but you didn't say which one was your all-time favorite. No, I never say that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All of them are. It changes, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 